it's a choice that a person will have to make on their own or with their family. When you're close to death and are a former congenital heart survivor with one of the worst congenital heart diseases, you don't think twice because you may not have that second chance of life. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and your host. I'm also a heart mom to Alexander, who was born with a single ventricle heart and who is 26 years old. And he's the reason that I started this podcast seven years ago. I'm very excited about today's show to feature a special heart warrior. Today's show is entitled Hepatitis C and Cardiac Transplantation. Leslie Castro is a 47-year-old former single ventricle patient from Pennsylvania. She was born with tricuspid atresia, pulmonary stenosis, and multiple other heart defects, and she had the classic Fontan at the age of 12 in 1985. Just over a year ago, she received a heart transplant. Her donor was a 29-year-old woman who was a hepatitis C positive intravenous drug user, and Leslie had to take a case study drug to avoid contracting the virus. Leslie had a very bumpy road to recovery with multiple complications involving her brain, heart, and lungs, and required procedures after the transplant to alleviate a brain bleed and drain fluid from her lungs. This is Leslie's second appearance on our program. My loyal listeners may remember Leslie's other program, Classic Fontan Survivor Post-Cardiac Transplant. And today, Leslie's going to teach us about how some heart transplant recipients are now receiving hearts from donors who tested positive for hepatitis C and what that means for donors and recipients. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Leslie Castro. Thank you, Anna. I am happy that in your first appearance, you talked about your medical history. So we're not going to talk about that a whole lot in this program, but it would be good for the people who haven't heard that show to understand a little bit about your history. So can you give us a brief summary? So as you know, I'm a former single ventricle patient with tricuspid atresia pulmonary stenosis, as well as Fontan-associated liver disease. I had the Blalock toxic shunt in 1973 and the classic Fontan in 1985 by Dr. Ralph Sievers at Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. In 2005, I had the Fontan revision, Cox Mace III procedure, and pacemaker implanted by Dr. Constantine Mavrudis and Dr. Carl Backer at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. I've had three unsuccessful cardiac ablations, numerous cardiac casts, liver biopsies, multiple TIAs, as well as arrhythmia issues, and five stents. In August 2019, I received a hep C donor heart at Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My cardiac surgeon was Dr. Christopher Shortino. So, wow, you have had a really complicated history. TIAs, for those of you who aren't familiar, means transient ischemic accident, and it's what some people refer to as a little stroke. It's where you have a brain bleed, but it's not as serious as a full-blown stroke. I've also had two major strokes, which left me with side effects. I have limited mobility in my left hand. Okay. And here's the thing. When you have TIAs, it puts you at risk for having a full-blown stroke. Correct. Wow. Okay. So you had your strokes before you had your transplant, I'm assuming? I had several TIAs prior to the transplant, plus a major stroke, as well as having a stroke during the transplant, amongst other multiple complications. During the process of transplantation, I went through uh, heart and liver transplant evaluations in November and December of 2018. I met with multiple people at Presbyterian Hospital. Wow. Okay. Well, let's go back pre-transplant and tell me how you found out about the possibility of receiving a hepatitis C heart. The heart transplant hep C coordinator, Tracy Sabatini, explained my options for a high-risk donor, which didn't necessarily have to be a hep C donor, but any donor who was at high risk. This includes inmates, 
people with sexually transmitted diseases and or intravenous drug users, to name a few high-risk cases. I didn't even know that people who were inmates were given the option to be donors. I mean, I guess that sounds stupid. It's just not something I ever thought about before. You know, in the past, it wasn't really much of an option. They basically, I guess, discarded those who were inmates and other forms of high risk because they weren't considered a good donor. So what's happened? Because there's so many people who are waiting for organs, they decided to go ahead and open up the donor pool? So basically, about three years ago, they decided to open up the donor pool and create a new drug for people who have received a donor who had hepatitis C and basically cure them of hepatitis. Wow. Okay, so if you were an inmate, you weren't even allowed to donate your organs, even if you wanted to, but that's changed in the last three years? People have had the option of having a high-risk donor. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a high risk. Right. There's paperwork that you have to fill out in order to even consider a high-risk donor. To broaden the uh, options for a person with, for example, congenital heart disease, as well as other people who have O positive blood or O negative blood, which normally don't have a great chance of survival because they're waiting forever for an organ that is rare. Uh, Okay. So I guess the transplant team sat down and said, okay, here's what can happen. Correct. They did. So basically, as a high-risk patient, because of being a single ventricle patient with a Fontan liver, heart transplant coordinator explained that if I was going to consider a high-risk donor, I needed to fill out a few consent forms. These consent forms that I signed gave me a broader array of possibilities for transplantation. Mm. Wow. But it also gave you a lot to think about, didn't it, Leslie? It did. And at the beginning, my family really wasn't on board. They were like, oh, crap. We know you're a little crazy, (laughs) but but this is going a little bit overboard. I was already up for heart and liver. And being a risk taker or being put in a position as a risk taker, In the past, with uh, classic Fontan and the Fontan revision, I said, what choices do I have? It's either I take it or I die. Right, right. I think the O positive blood was yet another complication that was going to make you less likely to receive the organs you needed, right? Yes. Wow. Okay, so your family's thinking, oh my goodness, she's a little bit crazy. What changed (laughs) their way of thinking? Well, my sister, my mother, my cousin, and my friend are all nurses. Oh, wow. And at first they were like, are you crazy? But as they thought about it, they said, if anybody could do it, it's Leslie. She's already passed all the odds. Let's go for it. What do we have to lose? And so they were on board. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Leslie, from the little bit of research that I did on hepatitis C and transplant, it appears that having hepatitis C or hep C, if we say hep C, it means hepatitis C, that's not necessarily a contraindication for donating a heart. And we talked about this a little bit in the first segment. What do you know about this research revolving around receiving or donating a hep C heart? I know that by receiving a hep C positive donor, it may be one way to help fight the organ shortage for heart transplantation, as well as other organ transplantations. So when you have hepatitis C, does that kind of contaminate all of your organs? It doesn't contaminate the other organs. Just I think that it's only with that organ. Hence the reason they give the hep C medication to cure hepatitis C directly after the transplant, starting from day one. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So we know now that by opening the donor pool to allow people who are hep C positive to be donors, that that might reduce some of the problems with us not having enough donor organs. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And because the medication is good enough now, if you know in advance that you're getting an organ donated from a hep C donor, they can give you medication. It's pretty powerful from the onset to try and cure the hepatitis C. Yes, correct. Okay. Well, so that's all of that's good news. It really is good news. Also, adult heart transplantation can be performed by using hepatitis positive donors without any adverse effects or outcomes. That, to me, is what's the most important thing. If you've got people with congenital heart disease who are waiting for an organ, we know that there are not enough organs for all the people who need them. And so being able to open up the donor pool a little bit more to allow other people to donate means that somebody with a congenital heart defect may not die on the list waiting for an organ, but that's only good if we know that when they receive that organ, it allows them to have a good quality of life. And from the research that I read, it looks like that was the case. Is that what your experience has been? As far as I know, yes. The drug is called Eclusa. It's a case study drug, and it's taken once a day for three months without any side effects. At least I didn't have any side effects. And I was told Eclusa, without insurance, cost $1,000 per pill. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So that's prohibitive for some people. I guess you would say it was prohibited, or basically they would have to find a way to do GoFundMes or so forth to get that amount, which is $90,000. $90,000 over the course of the three months? Correct. Correct. Wow, that's a lot of money. And that's only for that one drug. That's not all the other drugs that have to be administered to prevent rejection. Correct. Wow. Okay. So what are the other guidelines or recommendations regarding who should or shouldn't receive a hep C heart? Do you know? I don't believe there are any specific guidelines or recommendations. However, I would recommend signing the paperwork for a high-risk donor. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will receive a high-risk donor, such as a hep C donor heart, but it will provide you with more options, especially for those that are O positive and O negative blood types. Well, it just makes sense to me to allow yourself to have as many options as possible. If they tell you, hey, we found a heart, or in your case, a heart and a liver, Do you have the opportunity to say, wait a minute, I've changed my mind and I don't want that one? You do have a choice and you can decide to not choose a hep C heart or liver if you don't want to at the last minute. Okay. Right before transplantation, when they give you the call, they inform you yet again what type of heart they have for you. Mm. or liver, or kidney. Okay. And at that point, you either say yes 
I will accept it yet again, or no, I will not. Now, if you say no, if you refuse it because you found out that person's an intravenous drug user or something that makes you scared, by the time you get that phone call, does that hurt your chances to get the phone call again later on for an organ that perhaps is not a high-risk organ? You're still on the list. However, for congenital heart patients, I would not recommend denying an organ simply because you're already at the bottom of the totem pole in transplantation because congenital heart patients are very, very high risk. And normally when they go under for a transplant, they have multiple complications, not just a little, but multiple complications. And for congenital heart patients, usually the first week is the most critical. Absolutely. Now, After you got your hep C heart, did you have some complications? I already know you did a little bit. We've already discussed a little bit what they were. Can you talk to us about some of the complications, especially if it's related to the hep C donor? Yes. Related to the hep C donor, not so much. More so because of my age and the Fontan anatomy. Okay. I had a very rough recovery. But it wasn't because of the hep C donor heart. While in the hospital, I had multiple complications, such as a brain bleed, a seizure during the surgery, a stroke, pneumonia, pulmonary embolisms, sepsis, multiple Yikes. blood clots everywhere. Oh my God. I almost bled to death a week later. Paralyzed vocal cords, infiltrated hands, or a fusion, or the fluid buildup around both lungs blood infections, plus more. Oh my gosh, your family must have been so worried about you. Extremely. Because extremely. you were probably unconscious for a lot of that. Some of that sounds so serious. I can see them leaving you paralyzed or paralyzed and sedated until your body started to recover. You know, not necessarily, because when I woke up on the 10th, I had the surgery on the 8th in the middle of the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I woke up, I believe... On the 9th, late in the afternoon, or the 10th. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And I woke up alert. I had thumbs up. By the 11th, I was doing a video, talking to my brother, saying, hey, I did it. Great. I made it through. Everything's fabulous. And then within that week, everything started crashing down. (sighs) Wow. Okay, so you didn't have the bliss of being unaware. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, I knew what was going on. I had every department, kidney, liver, infectious diseases, the psychology, neurology, dietary, you name it, every single department taking care of me one week post-transplant. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. 
So, Leslie, you had us on the edge of our seat before the last break that every single department in the hospital was making a visit to your room. I imagine your room was like Grand Central Station. Talk to me about your recovery because it sounds like you had so many different complications. How long were you in the hospital? Pre-transplant, two months, about a month and a half after the transplant. That's actually not as long as I thought it would be. You're talking about six weeks. Right, basically. Okay. However, it didn't end there because I couldn't even walk. I went from the hospital to a rehabilitation center to learn how to walk, talk, and actually function. Basically, I had a physical, occupational speech therapy to get myself back to where I am now. So your stroke was that debilitating that it took away all of those abilities? The stroke, the sepsis, Uh the laying in a hospital bed for a long time, Mm. paralyzed vocal cords. I Mm. couldn't talk. I couldn't eat. Sure. It was horrible. Yeah. But after I spent two days in the rehab center, I went for actually the sixth liver biopsy, I believe. And at that time, they basically admitted me because yet again, I had the pleural fusion or Mm. fluid build up in my lungs. Mm -hmm. So I had to have my lung drained. Mm. I had three and a half liters Uh, of fluid taken out of my left lung. Wow. Just one lung. That's a lot. Wow. And it was building up into the second lung. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a lot to deal with. Do you know anybody else who has received an organ from a hep C positive donor? Actually, there was a congenital heart patient at Presbyterian Hospital who received a hep C heart in 2017. Oh, okay. So did you have a chance to actually meet with this other recipient to kind of get an idea of what your journey may be like? I actually never did. I was told that there were two congenital heart patients in 2017 that were on the same floor as myself that received a heart transplant. I did not know until later that one of them received a hep C donor heart. Wow. Okay, so it's not as rare as one might think. No, there's quite a few on the heart transplantation page on Facebook that have accepted a hep C donor heart. However, there is no hep C donor heart specific group or support group. Well, that's something that you can change, isn't it? Yes, eventually, yes. (laughs) Okay, well, let's talk about what advice you would have for somebody who's waiting for a heart or who might be considering whether or not they should or should not accept a hep C heart. It's a choice that a person will have to make on their own or with their family. When you're close to death and are a former congenital heart survivor with one of the worst congenital heart diseases, you don't think twice because you may not have that second chance of life. Right. I would do it all over again if it means that I will have more time with my family and friends. Well, I love that because you've been able to put a very positive spin on something that could be really scary. I'm very optimistic. Even though it was a struggle to go through the heart and liver transplant evaluation, I knew that there was a better outcome. And that was my end goal to have that better outcome. So Leslie, did you get the heart and the liver from that same hep C donor? I actually didn't. I went through the whole process clear up until June, and they thought I was going to receive both heart and liver. And in the end, after doing a last liver biopsy, they said that my liver would be okay. Oh, wow. So they were hoping that given a new heart, the liver would repair itself enough to be functional? Correct. And have you had biopsies since then to confirm that? I have had ultrasounds. Okay. And the last ultrasound, which the ultrasound is not always best case scenario. I think a combination of things would be the best as far as ultrasound, biopsy, to determine whether or not your liver is cirrhotic 
or not. And my last ultrasound and the time before pre transplant said that my liver was cirrhotic. But in the liver biopsy pre transplant, it said that I had liver fibrosis. And post transplant, it said that I had liver fibrosis. So they still think that I have liver fibrosis. For those listeners who don't know what liver fibrosis means, can you explain what that means? It's basically a scarring of the liver from Fontan operation. Okay. Did you want to say something else about it? No. And not only that, I do have to see a liver specialist every six months until my liver regenerates. So have they given you a prognosis of how long that normally takes? No, they haven't. However, I have a friend that received a heart transplant, and she was a tricuspid atresia patient, and it took her about three or four years. Oh my goodness, three or four years. Okay, so yes. not something quickly to resolve on its own, but it wasn't quickly happening either, right? It took years and years and years of having a Fontan heart for the liver to show some kind of damage, right? Correct. Okay. What are they saying to you now that you are, how long are you, two years post-transplant? I'm um, 16 months post-transplant. Okay. So you're 16 months post-transplant. What do the doctors say now as far as your prognosis? To be honest with you, they don't know what the future may hold because receiving a hep C organ along with taking the drug to cure hepatitis C, is all unknown territory for patients who accepted a hep C organ. Well, that makes sense. We don't know what the future holds any more than I know how much time I have either, right, Leslie? I mean, <laughs> right. I could have a car accident. I could have a stroke. I could have something happen just like anybody else. I would confess that you're at higher risk because you've already had TIAs. You've already had a stroke. You are on blood thinners, I imagine. Or, or are you? I am actually on one blood thinner. It's Eliquis. My mom took that too. That's supposed yes. to be much, much better compared to Coumadin. It's supposed to be a little bit less dangerous for you and a little bit easier to monitor. Correct. I went from taking about 40 pills a day to now taking 12 pills. Which still seems like a lot, but, but comparatively, that's a lot less. It actually is a lot less because I was taking close to 20, 25 pills, and it's not necessarily all heart-related. So it's because um, of the other complications that you've had that you're having to take some of these extra medications? I have hypothyroidism, which is somewhat common with Fontan. And I had a seizure during the transplant. So I am taking Keppra mm -hmm. for the seizure. After next year, if I do not have any more seizures, which I haven't, I will no longer be taking Keppra. So basically 10 pills for the rest of my life. Leslie, how would you rate your quality of life now? I feel great. I exercise every day. I go hiking. Well, not right now, but wow. it's wintertime. But in the summertime, I was walking from 6 to 12 miles a day. Wow. And I can actually run now. The other day, I was in the car with my mom, and it was very cold here, about 20 degrees. And she had the heat on extremely high, but it was normal for her because I was always cold. And I said, it's a sun in here. You're, <laughs> you're, you're killing me. <laughs> and she turned and looked at me and she's like, are you, are you sure? Do you want me to turn down the heat? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm dying. I'm sweating. I have beads of sweat rolling down <laughs> off, off me. And, and she was in tears Aww. because it was the first time that I ever was able to withstand the cold. I am so happy to hear this. I'm so happy that you've had a happy ending with your hep C heart and that it looks like your liver is probably going to recover. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all this really valuable information. And just so I am not remiss, this is not meant to be medical advice. We're just sharing Leslie's story. Of course, you need to check with your own doctors and your own transplant team to determine whether or not a hep C heart would be right for you. But it certainly is nice to hear a success story, Leslie. Thank you very much, Anna. Well, thank you, friends, for listening today. That's all we have for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, please consider being a patron.
We are with Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. It's Patreon dot com slash heart to heart. For a small monthly donation, you can help to support the longest running podcast for the congenital heart defect community. And that enables us to give resources for free to the congenital heart defect community all across the globe. So please do visit us at patreon.com slash heart to heart. Have a great week. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. 